was Al Bukhari? Al Bukhari, his name was Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn Mughira ibn Bardizba al Jufi uh, al Jufi Yumaulahum al Bukhari. His actual name is Muhammad. His name is Muhammad, father's name Ismail, and grandfather's name Ibrahim. So very easy to memorize. Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim, and his great grandfather Mughira was the one who converted to Islam. And Mughira converted to Islam during the lifetime of the Sahaba. Uh, that uh, the Sahaba they conquered the province of Khorasan. And Khorasan is in modern Afghanistan and Iran. It is in a province that is modern day Iran and Afghanistan. So Bukhari uh, is actually from the, the, the province of Bukhara or in that land Mawara and Nahar, which is uh, in English is called Trans Oxania. Uh, and this is the land which is now in modern day Iran. So Bukhari was a Persian. Bukhari was a Persian and he uh, obviously had the features of a Persian and he spoke Persian as his mother language. So his, the language he was fluent in was Persian and Arabic of course he was fluent in but it was an acquired language and it was not the language he spoke basically at home. And then Al-Bukhari and Al-Bukhari means he was from the city of Bukhara. So we say Imam Al-Bukhari is not even his name. It is his nisba, where is his city? And in those days, they would ascribe a person both to his blood and to his city. In terms of the day that he was born, he was born on either the 12th or 13th of Shawwal in the year 194. 12th or 13th of Shawwal, 194, which was the day of Jum'ah, which was the day of Jum'ah. In terms of his birth, there's nothing miraculous that was narrated in terms of what happened to him. But what we do know about his early childhood is two key events. Number one, that his father passed away when he was very, very young. He was very young and his father passed away. And number two, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he actually went blind at the age of three. He actually went blind at the age of three. Now let us get into his parents and we're gonna tie all these points together. His mother, we do not know too much about her. But what we do know about her is that she was someone that used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regularly. She was an abida. Like she loved worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what had happened was when Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah lost his eyesight at the age of three, she had dedicated herself that I'm going to continue praying tahajjud and qiyamul layl every single night and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns his eyesight, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns his eyesight. Then a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happens. And keep in mind here, Al-Bukhari was not blind for just a month or two. Al-Bukhari was blind for a significant amount of time. It could have been two or three years that he was blind. His mother never gave up hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She continued to make dua. And one night as she's sleeping, she sees Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim alayhi salam comes to her and says to her, Ya hadihi, O so and so, inna Allah yubashiruki, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the glad tidings, annahu qad radda uh, basar waladik, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, re has restored the eyesight of your child, li kathrati du'aik. And actually says to her, Ibrahim says to her, because of your du'a. Ibrahim alayhi salam says to her, Allah has restored the sight of your child because of your du'a. She wakes up, she goes to Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala. And as she wakes him up, he opens his eyes and, and he's looking around, clearly seeing, confused. You know, how is it that he can see and what's going on here? Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that du'a. And this is significant because we owe the entire legacy of Imam al-Bukhari to his mother, to the du'a of a mother. Now, there are a few stories about him when he was a child, all right, to show you how incredible uh, of, of a memory he had. First, one of the scholars that he studied with was a man by the name of Al-Imam Al-Dakhili. Al-Imam Al-Dakhili, rahimahullah ta'ala. And Al-Dakhili was considered like one of the most prominent hadith scholars in Bukhara. And Al-Dakhili, he used to write in his own uh, law, he used to have his own scrolls and he used to write his own ahadith. And one day, Al-Bukhari is sitting there. Al-Bukhari was only 11 years old, okay? And he says, حَدَّثَنَا Sufyan عَنْ أَبِي Zubair عَنْ Ibrahim." So he's going through the chain of narrators. Al-Bukhari raises his hand. He says, Ya Shaykh, in Abu Zubair lam yarwi an Ibrahim. He said, Shaykh, you know, Abu Zubair has never met Ibrahim. So what are you talking about? Of course he has. And he, he insisted. Al-Bukhari was like, no, they've never even met. <laughs> and he says, are you sure what you're talking about? And, and he got infuriated. Al-Dakhali is like, who's this 11-year-old kid trying to show me up in a halaqa and tell me that these two hadith narrators never met? So he was really mad. He said, Sayyidi. 
He said, you know, my master, go ahead and, and, and go back to your origin. Because al Adakhri, he used to copy his loh from all of his notes. He used to put it together for his classes. So he said, go back and see the original copy and see if you find that. So al he made the entire halaqa sit there while he went home, went through his scrolls so he could find that hadith and find that chain and he could come back to him. So here's Al-Bukhari, all the other students are mad at him because they just have to sit there and they're not even getting any ahadith. They're just waiting for their teacher to come back and he's all angry to figure out, you know, whether this 11 year old kid has a point. So Al-Dakhili comes back laughing and he says to Al-Bukhari, he says, Ya waladi, you know, oh my son. He says, فَحَدَثَ عَنْ مَنْ إِذَنْ So then who did he narrate from? Then what's the correct chain of narrators? Like how did you figure that out? So he said to him, قال, He says that Sufyan عَنِ الزُّبَيْرِ عَنْ عَدِي عَنْ Ibrahim. So Al-Bukhari gave him the correct chain. He's 11 years old. قال صدقت ونعم الغلام أنت He said, you know, you've told the truث and what a, what a bright young man you are. He, and he looked at him, he said, you're going to have a special status in this ummah. Like you've got a, you've got a bright future ahead of you. So Dakhri was actually relieved uh, at that. He was very um, he was very impressed by him. Now Al-Bukhari sees a dream when he's a child as well, when he's a young teenager as well, um, that many would actually see of him. Many ulama would see this dream and Al-Bukhari saw. Al-Bukhari saw a dream of himself walking behind the Prophet Wasallam. Every time the Prophet ﷺ puts his foot down, Al-Bukhari goes and puts his foot down there. And he saw this dream of himself as a young man. And subhanAllah, other ulama, other scholars as well, uh, they saw that dream. At the age of 16, his mother and older brother and him, they go for Hajj. And during that time, Hajj season and Mecca overall was the International University of Muslims. Because in those days, there is no two-week visa, you have to go and come back. If you're going to go for Hajj and you're coming from Andalus, do you think you're going to sit there for five days? You might live there for five years because this is your one and only time, lifetime. It'll take you two years to go from Andalus to Mecca. You really think you're going to spend two weeks in Mecca? You're going to stay there months, years maybe even, right? And what do you think the scholars are going to do when they're living in Mecca? They will benefit and narrate. And so Mecca was considered to be, for many centuries, the primary international Islamic university, where all the famous scholars in the world would be narrating fiqh and hadith and aqidah, whatever else is going on, they're all having their halaqat. So Imam al-Bukhari, at the age of 16, he sees all of this, he is dazzled. This is a dream come true. And he begs his mother, you go back with my brother, let me stay here. He wasn't planning to do this when he left Bukhara, but now that he gets to Mecca, he sees what he wants to do. So his mother, with his blessings, with her blessings, uh, allows him to remain in Mecca. And so he never returned permanently to Bukhara until the end of his life, as we just studied. And at the age of 18, he authored his first book. 18 years old, and he writes his first book. And this book, in now printed version, and I have it at home, it is in nine thick volumes, this thick. Now, what have we done at the age of 18? And Imam al-Bukhari writes a book which is one of the most advanced books or subjects possible, and that is Ilm al-Rijal or the science of men. To this day, scholars of hadith use this as a primary reference for figuring out the names, biographies, places. For Bukhari to have written this at the age of 18 shows us that he has mastered this field and that the other fields of hadith are now basically already within his grasp because this is the most advanced knowledge of uh, hadith. Of his greatest honors and privileges was he traveled to Baghdad and in Baghdad at the time was the greatest scholar of hadith alive and that is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And so Bukhari studied with Imam Ahmad when he was barely in his 20s and Imam Ahmad remarked a very uh, poignant, a very powerful thing about Imam Ahmad is now in his 70s, 60, 70 years old. Bukhari is, you know, 20s. Imam Ahmad said, I have never seen from the entire province of Khurasan someone like Muhammad ibn Ismail. Now Khurasan is one of the largest provinces of the empire at the time. And Imam Ahmad says, I have never met anybody from this entire province like Muhammad ibn Ismail. Scholars say, Imam Ahmad restricted himself to Khurasan because Bukhari is still in his 20s. Had he met Bukhari later on, then he wouldn't have to restrict himself only to Khurasan. So he's meeting Bukhari when Bukhari is still a young man 
Imam Ahmad is the undisputed champion of hadith. And he is saying in the entire province, what is Khorasan? Khorasan is parts of Iraq, all of Iran, Afghanistan. This is all Khorasan, right? So he's saying in this entire province, I have not yet met anybody, scholar or student, the likes of Imam al-Bukhari. Was Imam al-Bukhari married? Did he have children? As you mentioned earlier, it, Allah knows best, difference of opinion on this issue, but it doesn't seem that Imam al-Bukhari got married or had any children. And we learn from the books of, uh, from the books of uh, biography of Imam al-Bukhari, that Imam al-Bukhari had what we now call a uh, photographic memory. This is something we have now documented. It is now something science has proven. We know people who have photographic memories. Clearly, Imam al-Bukhari had photographic memory that he only needed to see a hadith once and he never needed the notes again. And Ibn Kathir writes, he would just read a page once and that page would be memorized with him for as long as he lived. And this is something that in his own lifetime, people began to doubt how is this possible? His memory was so amazing that in his own lifetime, scholars who were far senior to him began to say, these are rumors, these are legends, these are fairy tales. And on multiple times, scholars put him to the test in public and quizzed him in public. And of the most famous tests done of Imam al-Bukhari was when he was in his 30s. And he revisited Baghdad after Imam Ahmed passed away. He revisited Baghdad. Now his scholarship has now spread around the world. Everybody has heard of Bukhari. And Wallahi, it's an amazing thing at the time for somebody in his 30s to have such a reputation. And the scholars of Baghdad said, this guy clearly, his followers have made him bigger than he is. So we will demonstrate once and for all that there's more hype to the man than really there is the man. What did they do? They told Imam al-Bukhari, let us all meet in the Grand Masjid of Baghdad. They had, Baghdad has the famous Masjid, the Masjid al-Jami' al-Kabir, the big Masjid. And we will narrate 10 hadith, all of us, for our students to benefit from. And this was common at the time, that all scholars come together, you give 10, you give 10, you give 10, and they'll all take notes. And mashallah, tabarakallah, the students get the luxury of multiple, you know, uh, sheikhs giving multiple hadith. But they had tricked, uh, or they wanted to trick Bukhari. And what they wanted to do was to mix and match the chain of narrators called Isnad with the matin, with the actual text, and to put the wrong matin with another Isnad. So that outwardly it would appear that this hadith looks reasonable because A narrates from B narrates from C narrates from D that the Prophet ﷺ said إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ But the fact of the matter A, B, C, D didn't narrate إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Rather E, F, G, H narrated إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ You see what I'm saying here is that the isnad cut, the matan cut and pasted it together and you concoct a new hadith. Now for the scholars of hadith they don't just look at إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ They look at the chain going back. And if the chain is different, guess what? This is called a different hadith. For us miskeen, us basic people, we just care about إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ We don't care about the chains. For the scholars of hadith, if there's a different chain, it's considered a different hadith. So, each one of the ten mixed and matched all of their ten. And the first of them began, Bukhari sitting there, and he quotes the first hadith. And it's for the student's perspective, a famous hadith. Let's say we don't know the, the actual 100, but it's a famous hadith. All the students have heard. So he mentions the first hadith, a different is not. Then he asked Bukhari, do you have this hadith? Imam Bukhari says, no, I never heard this hadith. Now for the students, this is the most obvious hadith in the world. Bukhari is saying he's never heard it. The second hadith, again Bukhari says, I've never heard this. The third, the fourth, all 10. And these basic students know all 10. And Bukhari is saying, I've never heard these 10. Then the next 10 begins with the next shaykh. Then the next 10, until finally all 100 have been done. And Bukhari has admitted he is jahil for all 100 of them. So clearly they believe they have won now, right? Because by the way, if Bukhari had said he has heard of them, it would have exposed him. These hadith don't exist. You made a mistake, right? At least he's saying he's not heard of them, but now he really looks like a jahil that he doesn't, hasn't heard anything. Then when, he's fin when they're finished, Bukhari has said, are you guys done? They said yes. So he said, okay, as for you, back to the first one. Your first hadith was A, B, C, D, E, F, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَادُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ It is incorrect. It should be E, F, G, H, I, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَادُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ And then he began with the second and he corrected. Then the third and he corrected. All the way till he regurgitated 100 incorrect hadith and he corrected every single one of them. 
Ibn Hajar, the famous commentator of Bukhari, who died 852, so many centuries after Bukhari, Ibn Hajar said, what is amazing is not that Imam al-Bukhari knew the right hadith. We would expect this from a hadith master. We would expect it. That he knows it's not A, B, C, D, E, it's rather E, F, G, H, I. We expect this. What is amazing is that he memorized the incorrect versions and the order that they appeared after having only listened to them once. And this is a live test done in the entire Masjid of Baghdad with all of the uh, thousands of students there that Imam al-Bukhari's memory was tested and these scholars clearly realized the hype is true and the man truly meets up that uh, hype. Let us talk about what was the inspiration behind a Sahih al-Bukhari. The first he tells us of a story that he had as a young man. The story that he had as a young man. And he tells us that when he was a young man, he saw in his dream the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he, Bukhari was standing in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there were flies coming and Imam Al-Bukhari was standing there warding off the flies, protecting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from these flies. When he woke up, he asked his Shaykh what this dream meant and the Shaykh said, you will ward off fabricated hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like these flies basically. Your job in life is to protect the Prophet from these pesky flies that are trying to come to him but have nothing to do with him. And this is hadith falsely ascribed. These are fabricated hadith. So Imam al-Bukhari got the idea of basically specializing in hadith. And then as for the idea of actually writing Sahih al-Bukhari, this came to him from his famous teacher Ishaq ibn Rahweh. Ishaq ibn Rahweh, another famous Persian scholar of hadith and one of the giants of hadith of his time. That once Ishaq ibn Rahwe was teaching his students, Bukhari was his primary student, and he happened to mention that it would be such a good idea if somebody wrote a book concentrating only on the Sahih Hadith. So Imam al-Bukhari said, that idea entered my heart as a young student, and I retained it until I was able to do it. So this was his idea to write a book of only Sahih Hadith, and it took him a total of 16 years to write it. And he compiled it primarily in the city of Basra, where he lived for five years. And he performed Hajj every year. And he's sifting through over 600,000 hadith that he had memorized. 600,000. He is sifting through and trying to find those hadith that fit the match the most perfectly to write his Sahih. Then, during the last few years of writing the Sahih, he moved to Medina because he wanted to have the blessings of living in Medina. And especially in the last year of those 16 years, he spent his entire time going over and re-editing and revising. So his entire day and night is dedicated for Sahih al-Bukhari. And he told his students later on that for every single hadith that I chose, I made special wudu and I prayed two raka'a istikhara in the rawda of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for every single hadith. So there's a spiritual element here as well. Uh, it is narrated that towards the end of his life, Imam al-Bukhari was going on a journey to uh, make a purchase, some, some business transactions. Obviously, Bukhari had to dabble a little bit in business. And so he went on a ship to go to a land. Uh, we don't know to purchase what, but he had with him a good amount of money, 10,000 dinars. 10,000 gold coins is probably like uh, maybe a quarter of a million dollars. That's a lot of money, like 10,000 gold coins. He had them and he's on a ship and the ship is a long journey. In the process of the ship, he befriends somebody and it turns out this somebody was of a low character, evil character. And Imam Bukhari just happens to have a conversation with him and says, yes, I have 10,000 dinars. I'm going to buy such and such thing, you know, whatever it might be. The next day, news spreads that the captain of the ship is saying, Somebody has stolen 10,000 dinars from this companion of Bukhari. And we will search the whole ship to see who has 10,000 dinars. You understand what he's done? He's flipped it around now. And the guy is saying, somebody stole my 10,000 dinars. Now, even if they had found a 10,000 dinars, eventually Bukhari's name would have been exonerated because simple. I mean, Bukhari can tell you the characteristic of the dinars. Bukhari can tell you things. The man hasn't seen the money. But he's just attempting to get this big money, perhaps far-fetched chance, right? Maybe he might get it. So the cap, uh, uh, when Bukhari hears this, he takes the bag of gold coins, puts it in his, uh, in his sleeve, 
goes to the top of the ship and then when nobody's looking, he throws it into the water. The captain searches top to bottom, nothing is found. Later on, the man comes and says, I know you weren't lying, you're Imam al-Bukhari, you must have had the money. Where is the hiding place? Now, the plot has been exposed. Imam al-Bukhari casually told him, I threw it over this overseas, just threw it overboard. The man said, what? Are you a fool? I mean, even if I wasn't able to get it and I lost, at least you could have benefited. Now neither of us benefits. So what did Imam al-Bukhari say? He said, I have spent a lifetime making sure that my credibility is clean so that the ahadith of the Prophet will be accepted from me. And this is worth much more than 10,000 dinars. That can go, but my reputation cannot be tarnished or else the hadith that I'm narrating will be tarnished. So he gave up a fortune just so that possibly a question mark might not come. That where, where did the 10,000 go? We don't know the real story. So uh, Imam al-Bukhari simply got rid of it just so that his image is not uh, tarnished. It's very rare, very rare in the history of the Ummah that you find a scholar who is truly a master of multiple fields. Very rare. Yes, you can be good in multiple fields, but a master. This is very rare. And Imam al-Bukhari was one of those. He was a specialist obviously of hadith, and he was also a specialist of aqidah, theology. And he was also a specialist of fiqh. And he wrote books in hadith, and he wrote big books on aqidah, theology, and he wrote books on fiqh. And his sahih demonstrates his speciality in these three fields. And once Imam Muslim uh, came up to him in public gathering, and Imam Muslim kissed him on his forehead, and he said, دَعْنِي أُقَبِّلُ رِجْلَيْكَ يَا أُسْتَاذَ الْأُسْتَاذِينَ يَا أُسْتَاذَ الْأُسْتَاذِينَ وَيَا شَيْخَ الْمُحَدِّثِينَ وَيَا طَبِيبَ الْحَدِيثِ فِي عِلَلِهِ Allow me to kiss your feet. This is not justice just to kiss your forehead. Of course, he's just saying this. He's not going to bow down and kiss his feet. Allow me to kiss your feet. دَعْنِي أُقَبِّلُ رِجْلَيْكَ يَا أُسْتَاذَ الْأُسْتَاذِينَ O teacher of teachers. وَيَا شَيْخَ الْمُحَدِّثِينَ and you are the Shaykh of all Muhaddithin. And O oh, doctor of Hadith, Tabib al Hadith, fi ilalihi, in its uh, hidden defects. And ilal, the hidden defects, is the most difficult chapter of analyzing a Hadith. And he's saying, Imam al Bukhari, you are the PhD, the doctor. You are the an uh, analyst of, uh, of the, the defects of Hadith. This testimony is coming from the second most famous scholar of Hadith in the world, that's Imam Muslim. And Imam Muslim is saying, Bukhari is not one notch above me. Bukhari is light years ahead of me. Now you can imagine he probably had a lot of haters, right? As his reputation grew, especially a 21 year old walking into cities where they have 70 year old Hadith scholars and everyone leaves those 70 year old Hadith scholars because they realize that the 21 year old knows what he's talking about a lot more. Even though Al-Bukhari has the adab that we've mentioned and he's so careful not to offend anyone, not to say anything bad about someone, he gains his level of haters. So Al-Bukhari rahimahullah, uh, the way it starts off, he goes to Naysabur. And Naysabur was where he taught Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala. There was a great scholar there, a great hadith scholar there by the name of Yahya al-Zuhali. Yahya al-Zuhali was considered the greatest muhaddith of that, of that city, right? And one of the greatest muhaddithin of the time. And he was, the, he was the primary teacher of Imam Muslim until Imam al-Bukhari came along. And when an Imam Bukhari came along, you know, he directed people to him, he praised him and everything like that. But Yahya al-Zuhali realized that his students were slowly decreasing and they were all going to and Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala. So what is the easiest way, what is the dirtiest way and cheapest way to discredit someone? You know how? You label them. You say, he's a Wahhabi, he's a Sufi, don't listen to him. He secretly belongs to this group. So what did Yahya Dhuhari do? He did exactly that. His ego got to him, his jealousy got to him. So he told people that Al-Bukhari is secretly from Al-Mu'tazila. And Al-Mu'tazila, this was the group that tortured Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala. And Imam Ahmed had just passed away at this point. So they were extremely unpopular. I mean, they, their, their da'wah was ruined because of Imam Ahmed. He fought it till the end. And they said that the Qur'an is a creation. It's not the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they denied Allah's speech, right? So Yahya al-Zuhari says, I heard al-Bukhari says that Allah doesn't speak, that the Qur'an is a creation of Allah. He spread that rumor. 
So there were two implications of that. One of them, that Al-Bukhari secretly belonged to a deviant group. Secondly, there was this mistrust that he was secretly trying to spread that da'wah, that he was going to take over the city and then he was going to lead you all astray. SubhanAllah, these dirty tactics, they existed even then as well. And unfortunately, Yahya al-Dhuhali succeeded in turning the people of Nezabur against the Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala. Al-Bukhari goes back to his hometown of Bukhara and you know, people receive him well and everything is like, okay, you know, you're back home, alhamdulillah, this legend of ours that left, you know, 40 years ago and that's gone around the world and, and become the most famous person in the Muslim world, come back to your city of Bukhara and so on and so forth. The governor puts on a reception for him and the governor who's name is Khalid al-Dhuhali, he's not related to Yahya al-Dhuhali, his name is Khalid al-Dhuhali. He tells al-Bukhari, I want you to come teach me and my kids hadith in our house. Imam Bukhari said, nope, you want to learn hadith, you come to the masjid. And he said, wait, you know, but I just want you to come teach me and my, I'll pay you well, just come teach me and my kids hadith in the house. He said, no. He said, you want to learn hadith, you come to the masjid. Then he said, fine, well, can I have a particular section in the masjid for me and my family? Imam al-Bukhari said, if you want to learn hadith, you have to sit in the circle of hadith. Khalid al-Dhuhali, he threatened him. And then Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that I will never sell ilm for my own integrity, like for my own personal gain. So whatever you do, Allah al-Musta'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect me. Go ahead and do what you're going to do. If you want to learn hadith, you come to the masjid just like everyone else. Khalid al-Dhuhali now starts to slander him as well. What does he do? He spreads the old rumor now that was spread by Yahya al-Dhuhali that, he's, that he secretly belongs to al-Mu'tazila. And then what he does is he starts to pass fake fatwas in the name of an Imam al-Bukhari to make a mockery of him. And you know, subhanAllah, this is especially significant in our day and age, like with the internet, because it's so frequent that, you know, it'll show up on Yahoo News or something like that, that this sheikh who's a really famous scholar in the Middle East, and I'm not referring to a particular incident, I'm really not, because sometimes it turns out to be true, unfortunately. But many times, like this sheikh gave this fatwa, and it's a mockery and everyone circulates it and makes fun of the, the sheikh and so on and so forth. What did they do to Al-Bukhari? The same thing. Al-Dhuhali, he goes to another sheikh, and this shows you that ego is there, by the name of Huraith ibn Abi Al-Waraqa. Uh, Ibn Abi Al-Warqa, I'm sorry. And he says to Huraith, listen, you start discrediting Al-Bukhari, I'll put you in a position where you'll be the mufti of the city. You will replace Al-Bukhari in the city. So what did they do? They started to spread false fatawa in the name of Al-Bukhari and ridiculous fatawa. And so, it, so they made the, the first fatwa they spread that went viral. They said that Al-Bukhari says that if you drink the milk of a sheep, then that sheep is mahram to you. Right, because like the breastfeeding rules. So they said Al-Bukhari is ridiculous. He says that the rules of Rida'a uh, actually apply to sheep as well and goats as well. So they spread that rumor about him. And so people started to say, Samirtum, did, did you guys hear Akhir Fatwa Al-Bukhari, the last Fatwa that Al-Bukhari gave? And they'd laugh about it and they'd mock him and so on and so forth. So they hurt Al-Bukhari, they, they slandered him. And Al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, at this point, they, they spread a Fatwa about him that was so bad. He's sitting in the masjid in Bukhara, he's 60 years old. And a group of young men walk in and they say, did you give this fatwa? And before he could even answer, they jumped on him and started to beat him. So this great alim, the greatest scholar in the world is bloodied up and bruised up and his credibility is lost. And he's so depressed about that, that he says, you know what, I'm leaving you people. And he made a dua against them. And you know, subhanAllah, that's permissible to do, right? Against those who wrong you. He actually made a dua against them. He said, Allah man taqam minhum. He said, oh Allah, you know, avenge uh, me for what they've done. And he says, Allahumma arihim ma qasaduni bihi fi anfusihim wa awladihim wa ahlihim. That's a powerful dua, which is basically, you know, turn it back on them and their families and everything they accuse me of, put it back on them and their children and their families. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, he says that Al-Bukhari, when he left Bukhara, the very next year, Al-Dhuhali, Khalid Al-Dhuhali got caught with corruption. And the Khalifa sent an order to the people to not only kill him, they tied him to the back of a donkey. Don't mess with the awliya of Allah. They tied him to the back of a donkey and, they, and the donkey pulled him by his legs all around the city, the governor, and the people spit on him and they lashed him and they dragged him to prison and he died in a prison cell. No one cared for him. Huraith, that scholar, also corruption came about him. And Ibn Kathir says he was tested in every single way that you could possibly be tested with. Disease, hatred, corruption, everything. Uh, was hurled against him because of what he did. Subhanallah. So that's the power of the dua, and that's why Rasulullah says that dua al mazlum the dua of one who is oppressed, there is no hijab between that dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if it's a kafir, if it's a non Muslim that makes dua to Allah that's wrong, Allah accepts it. What then? 
of the greatest muhaddith in the world, the greatest scholar in the world, when he makes dua against the people because of the way that they treated him. So he went to a small, tiny town called Khartanak. Khartanak, he had a few uh, relatives there. It was on the outskirts of Bukhara. It was between Bukhara and Samarqand, just kind of alone. I mean, he's like, he, he's so disgusted with the way he's been treated by these different people. And this is very significant. SubhanAllah, this man, who's an ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, one of the most fascinating human beings that's ever walked the face of the earth. And he was rejected and turned away by the people. And bad things started to happen to those cities, by the way, when they did that to him. And Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah just went to Khartanak. And uh, in his last year, when he's 62 years old, he spends Ramadan just with some of his relatives in Khartanak. And Abdul Qudus ibn Abdul Jabbar, he says that I heard him in the last 10 nights of Ramadan making dua. And he says, Allahumma qad laqat alayya al-ardu bima rahubat faqbidni ilayk. That, oh Allah, the earth, though it's expansive, it's, it's suffocating. I mean, the people, I'm, I'm being rejected from all sides. I'm being turned away from all of these cities. Again, the name calling, the slandering, the labels, right? That the people that are low have to resort to. And they think they'll crush his legacy and they'll have a legacy instead. But instead, they have no legacy. And it only further helps us appreciate this man of Bukhari. And remember, this is the man who narrates in the very beginning of his book, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ That actions are but by intention. So if this is sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept. And also what? That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّ اللَّهِ إِذَا حَبَّ قَوْمًا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the people, تَلَاهُمْ Allah tests them. He has full faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Oh Allah, you know, the world is rejecting me, the earth is constricting. So take my soul, accept me, take me back to you. And he makes a dua as well on the last night of Ramadan. And listen to what he says. He says, Allahumma tawaffani ilayka ghayru maftoon. Oh Allah, take me back to you. Let me leave this world without being maftoon. Like, I don't want to be involved in fitna. I don't want to be involved in these tests and trials. Khalas, I don't want anything to do with these things. And I don't want to be tested in a severe way. Khalas, it is what it is. It's done. Now, when Al-Bukhari makes that dua, look at how Allah accepts this dua. Ramadan finishes. And when I say Ramadan finishes, I mean the night of the Adhan of Maghrib. Al-Bukhari is about to set out the, the night of the Adhan of Maghrib, the last night of Ramadan. Ramadan has just ended. It's Laylatul Eid. It's the night of Eid. He just finished his Ramadan. He's about to get on a camel uh, to leave. And as he's about to uh, get that camel, get on that camel, um, he suddenly says that I'm feeling weak. I can't get on the camel. They said, what do you mean? You look fine. He says, you know, I, I, I just feel weak right now. And he started to vomit. And he started to sweat, he developed a fever, and he died literally right after Ramadan. SubhanAllah. On, as he was about to make his way to Samarqand and to give it another shot. Shunned by people, rejected by people, just with a few relatives around him, this man passes away. And SubhanAllah, this is, this is very significant because his brother saw a dream that night. And his brother saw a dream of the Prophet Wasallam standing with some of the Sahaba and the Prophet Wasallam was waiting. Like the Prophet Wasallam, the Sahaba are trying to move and the Prophet Wasallam is waiting. And so his brother says that the Sahaba said to the Prophet Wasallam, you know, man tantadirun, who are you waiting for? So the Prophet Wasallam responded, nantadiru Aba Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. We're waiting for Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. We're waiting for Imam al-Bukhari. That's the night before he passed away. And Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he leaves this world, he passes away on that night. And that was Shawwal, the first day of Shawwal uh, in the year 256 after Hijrah at the age of 62 years old. Now subhanAllah, when the people of Samarqand heard that he died and they heard that he was going to make their way to them, they came and they took his body and they brought him to Samarqand and they prayed janaz on him after Eid al-Fitr in the thousands, one of the largest janazas in Islamic history. So subhanAllah, even though the people tried to turn him away, his janazah is one of the largest in Islamic history. And when they went to open his grave, which is now modern day Uzbekistan, still the grave of Imam Bukhari. There, Unfortunately, a lot of rituals there too as well. But when they went to open his grave, they had a strong scent there, a strong scent of musk that was there. Until today, that scent is there. Until today, the grave of Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, has a strong scent to it. And this is Al Imam al-Zahbi rahimahullah, says, uh, he actually quotes all of the years that people went to visit and they documented the scent is still there. The smell is still there. The smell is there, still there. This man that defended the Prophet Wasallam that left behind, uh, you know, and just think about it. The Prophet Wasallam said that one of, the, one of the things that a person leaves behind that benefits them is ilmun yintafa'u bihi, knowledge that benefits the people. 
At what moment on earth is a person not narrating a hadith of Al-Bukhari, Imam Al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala? At what point in earth is a person not saying Rawah Al-Bukhari, a scholar or a regular person or so on and so forth? You know, this is the greatest legacy that has been left behind of knowledge after the Prophet um, and his companions. And when Al-Bukhari passed away, remember that dream he had when he was a kid, putting his foot in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim had the same dream. Najm ibn Fudayr ibn Ayyad, he had the same dream. All of these, all of his colleagues and all of his students start to see the dream of their teacher, Al Imam al-Bukhari, putting his footsteps in the footsteps of the Prophet This time he follows him, nahsabuhu kathalik, we, we hope that that's the case, uh, into al-Jannah, into, into the ranks of al ibiyin those that are held in high rank. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon him, to accept his everything that he's done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of his, his effort for us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to accept his sincerity um, and, to, and to make this a legacy that we can benefit from inshallah ta'ala and that we can uh, continue with bidnillahi ta'ala.